My earliest experiences dealing with race occurred while I was in secondary school. I was privileged enough to make it into the top public school in my state. I remember my first day of fifth grade when we were introducing ourselves. I said both my parents were teachers. Wow, your parents graduated high school? The white kid next to me asked. I asked him something along the lines of, yeah, why? And he responded, well, because you're black. I was in the third grade when I started attending a private school that was predominantly white. My sister and I were one of the first people of color the school had ever seen. I had befriended a few of the popular girls in my class. One day I was late to the playground. I saw the group of girls playing together and I went over to play with them. When I asked them to jump into the game, they stared at me with a repulsive look. The ringleader said, we don't wanna play with you anymore because you're not like us and your hair is different than ours. It was hard to register what they meant at first because why would anyone not want to play with someone else just because of their thick black curly hair that they were born with? I was so hurt because in my third grade mind, I had assumed they were my friends and friends don't make other friends cry. It was one of the first times my innocence was stripped from me and I realized that even my light fair skin was still seen as black and I was not the same as them. To this day, I still struggle with loving and feeling pretty with my natural curls. Rather than my earliest experience with race, I'll share my most painful. Nothing hurts more than your child's first encounter with racism. I'll never forget the day my youngest son came home from third grade and told me David Walker called him an N-word. I always knew that day was coming. I wanted to let loose with my emotions and anger, but I knew that wasn't going to achieve anything. It might just confirm an expectation about how a black person would behave. I called David's house and his mother answered the phone. I told her who I was and said, I'm going to assume you don't know what happened with David and Mark today. Otherwise, I'm sure you would have called to apologize. She knew, but her instinct turned immediately to protecting her son. He didn't know what the word means. He didn't understand. He's not a racist. Please don't think of him that way. I interrupted her and said, all that may be true, Miss Walker, but frankly, this moment is not about David's defense. It's about how my son is feeling and what I'm asking you to do about it, to have David apologize, to have him tell Mark he knows what he said was wrong and that he didn't mean to deliver the sting and stigma of that word. David apologized, but it was hollow. The next day, my son went to school knowing that everyone, it seemed, heard him tagged with that word. The apology didn't erase the incident. I doubt he really understood that was the day he learned he could be singled out as other in the most hateful way. But I knew that he had arrived at that day and that it would surely happen again. It was at high school where I had my earliest and most visceral memory of racism. It was senior year and I was vying for homecoming queen along with all the other girls who were outgoing, engaged, and ex exuding school spirit. After a long buildup, the voting happened. I could barely sleep that night. When we arrived at school the next morning, the list was posted. There were six homecoming princesses and six princes in the homecoming court, and I wasn't one of them. I was disappointed and a little surprised based on the whisper talk. That night, I cried over it with my mom. The phone rang. I heard an odd, stilted conversation. My tears gave way to my curiosity. My mom said it was an anonymous caller saying that the homecoming ballot box had been rigged. Unsure of what to do, my mom went to the high school principal the following morning. She asked hard questions. He admitted with me in the room that it was not okay for a black princess to be seen with a white prince. And he had decided to make a substitute for me in the homecoming court. I asked why? But I guess I knew. This was the problem of being the only black family in my town. I don't remember the rest, but I do know my mom fixed it. But on homecoming night, it never felt right. I felt like an imposter. I didn't feel pretty or worthy. My date, Scott, was the football team star, loved by everyone. I even felt like I was disappointing him. I was already tired of being black. 
My first experience where I was acutely conscious of my race didn't happen until college. Growing up in a mixed race home, it never occurred to me to treat anyone different because of how they looked. Consequently, it never occurred to me that anyone might treat me different on account of being black. It never occurred to me that no one was asking my white friends, where are you really from, Texas? Is that the language of your people? No, it's an assignment for French class. Why are you driving late? I'm on my way home from work, officer. Or, do you have any more of this in the back? No, ma'am, I can't check that. I don't work here. The first time I really internalized that someone might be treat me differently happened in college. I was walking a drunk friend home back to their dorm after a party. It was cold and late, so after I saw them, I started jogging home. About halfway back, I passed a group of guys on the other side of the street. As I passed them, one of them yelled, what'd you steal, N-word? Surprise, I stopped and looked around. No one could conceivably be talking to me that way. The one who yelled saw me and stopped and followed up with, you heard me. The rest of the group burst out laughing. I ran home much faster. I went to a predominantly white boarding school for high school. I was 14 years old, miles away from home. And for the first time, I was often the only person of color in many of my classes. This was the first time I truly know, knew what it meant to be a minority. There were so many things that I had to go through and experience alone. The shame I felt wearing a bonnet to bed or the assumptions made about my scholarship status, fielding questions about the latest slang words, being in an institution where words like headmaster and housemaster were the norm, constant digs at my intelligence from students and teachers alike. The classic American novel, Huck Finn, was mandatory reading for all freshmen. I will never forget the first time we read passages out loud. The sting of the N-word rolling off the tongues of my white peers like it was nothing. The permission and insistence to read the text verbatim came from my white male teacher. There was no regard for how that would make me feel. No sense of awareness or empathy. An adult who was responsible for my mental, emotional, and physical safety harmed me in ways he'll never know, and empowered white students in their feelings of superiority. Not to mention the burden placed on my shoulders to represent and speak for all black people at the age of 14 and correct the narrative that was being told. I never actually said the N word when he called upon me to read in class. I knew that defiance didn't sit well with my teacher, but I also knew it would make others think twice when the only black person in the class refused to say the word. One of our most prominent black donors visited the campus that year. I made it my mission to speak to him and illuminate my experience, as well as the experience of my black peers. Because even though I was a minority, I wasn't alone and I wasn't powerless. Huck Finn was removed from the curriculum and has not been taught since. The administration hoped to properly train instructors on how to teach sensitive content. 15 years later, I'm still waiting for that training to happen. One of my earliest experiences dealing with race occurred during my sophomore year of college when Trump won the presidential election. In celebration of his election, two students from Babson College started to terrorize black students at Wellesley College, many of whom were friends of mine. They yelled, make America great again, spit at them, called them racist and homophobic slurs while doing loops around their living space in a pickup truck. I often think about the students at Babson College and other schools who held the same beliefs as those two, but didn't feel empowered enough to drive out and frighten other students. Where are they now? What businesses are they running? What policies are they writing? My parents self-admittedly protected me from an early age. They were black and from the South, living in an all white suburb on the West Coast. My father always told me that I can do or be anything that I wanted, while at the same time guiding me to navigate around the unwritten rules of how not to be an uppity Black person. In that regard, he assured me that I should expect to work twice as hard for half the credit. 
That's what he did, and he was the valedictorian of his 1954 high school class. For that honor, he got to enlist in the Air Force. Most colleges weren't accepting Blacks back then, and those that were required more money than he had. He is the second of 12 kids. My grandparents were former sharecroppers. I didn't know that I would have to keep defending my right to be educated while Black throughout the rest of my academic career that all of my accomplishments or talents would be judged in reference to the color of my skin. You speak so well for a black kid. This college is too difficult for you. You won't get in. You only got into college because they needed to bump their diversity quota. Or are you here on an athletic scholarship? Why did I have to be scrutinized and criticized just because I had the audacity to be black and pursue my passions? My earliest experience dealing with race, in the US at least, was during my freshman year at college. Prior to this, most of my exposure to the United States came from film and music, mediums where African-American narratives are strongly represented, if, at least if you're looking in the right places. So when I left my home country for college in the United States, I knew enough to expect I'd be feeling at least a little bit of otherness, and that as a young black immigrant, there would always be a silent urgency to being on my best behavior at all times, particularly around authority figures. That was all priced in, and so I wasn't sensitive about it. But in my first few weeks, what caught me totally unprepared was the nervous and slight fearful glances from my own classmates, most of whom were 18-year-old kids from suburbs across the country. At times, it felt like that gaze followed me everywhere, whether I was searching for a seat in a crowded lecture hall, entering my dorm building, or taking a nighttime walk on the streets of my liberal college town. On a campus where only 2% of the students are black, many of them af athletes, I definitely looked out of place. And predictably, this manifested itself in racial profiling that was sometimes a bit comical, like when a student somehow mistook me for an athlete, and sometimes very scary, like when a police officer slowed his car down by me in the middle of a run to question, what exactly was I running away from? Early on in life, well before I was able to drive, I was trained on how to interact with the police during a traffic stop. Turn off your music. Roll down the window before the officer arrives. Keep both hands on the steering wheel. Ask questions before moving. My wallet's in my back pocket. May I reach for it? And my insurance information is in my glove compartment. May I reach for it? When I started driver's ed, I assumed this was a lesson that everyone had received. I was initially stunned that my classmates had never learned this lesson. Later, I was even more stunned in how many times I've had to use this lesson. In college, I was an athlete. The school I attended up until my sophomore year was halfway across the country. My coach gave us a week to fly home to spend with our families before training camp started up. I flew back to NYC. After a couple of days, I went home to Bridgeport, Connecticut to see my immediate family. The girl I was dating at the time had invited me to a birthday party in New Haven. I gassed up the car, picked her up, and hit the road. When we arrived, we hung out for about an hour before someone said they needed to go to the liquor store. Everyone that knew me understood that I didn't drink, so I was always labeled the designated driver. I offered to take two friends that I met at the party to the liquor store. They told their friends and family, and we took off. Leaving the liquor store, I noticed a cop driving behind us. Normally, if you aren't doing anything wrong and have nothing to worry about, you shouldn't feel any type of way while being tailed by the cops. Unfortunately, that was not the case. I had many friends and family who had not had great experiences with the police, so I always get a bad feeling when they're behind me. Within minutes, the red and blue lights went off, so I pulled over. Once pulled over on the side of the road, I waited for the cop to follow through with the procedures for a routine traffic stop. That, however, did not happen. 
We waited in the car for about five minutes. I had met these two friends at the party for the first time. So I asked them both if there was any reason for that the cops would pull us over. I also asked them if there was anything I should know about before the cop walked over to the car. They both reassured me I had nothing to worry about. This traffic stop was different. A voice came over the loudspeaker telling everyone to put their hands outside the car except for the driver. Everyone followed through. The passenger in the front seat put his hands out of the window and so did the person sitting behind. This means that all the windows were down and you could see everything in the car. On the loudspeaker, the officer told me to take the keys out of the ignition, throw them to the ground and place my hands on the steering wheel. You could tell the officer was agitated by his voice. It did not help that everyone in my car was also nervous. I already had my license, insurance, and registration on my lap for easy access. Once the keys were on the ground, all I can see is the brightest flashlight in the world running over to me in my rear room mirror and nothing else. I'm looking straight ahead when the officer arrives at my driver's side window. As I turn to my left to greet the officer, his gun is underneath the flashlight pointed at my face. He was a white cop about my height, standing about one to two feet away from me, very upset. He also looked nervous. I froze and made eye contact with him while my hands were still on the steering wheel. My skin felt like pins and needles. Seconds later, I asked him what I had done wrong. Before I was able to finish my sentence, he tells me to shut up and asks me what I'm doing there. I tried to answer him, but every time I spoke, he would cut me off and tell me to shut up. I'm pretty sure I realized that at some point that this is what all the talks I'd had with my parents were for. Every other word out of his mouth was an F-bomb, followed by shut up. Again, he asked me what I'm doing there, and before I can finish, cuts me off. Meanwhile, people are driving by, looking at me like a zoo animal in a cage, while the other two passengers are now nervous as well. The cop goes around to question the other passengers in the car using profane language and not once lowering his gun. It's very hard to concentrate when a loaded gun is pointed in your face against your will. You literally have no control. By the time he gets to the passenger to the back of the car, he asks him why he's crying. The passenger behind the front seat says he has a three-year-old daughter and he has been shot before. He asks the officer to lower his gun to make us feel more comfortable and tells him that we have nothing to hide. The gun was never lowered. The officer comes back to my side and asks me what I have in the car. I let him know that we have nothing and that we're all just college kids from the surrounding areas. He follows up with a similar response to the ones that came before, telling me to shut up and that he's going to search the car if he wanted to. He said that he knew we were out to cause trouble and that he needed to do what he said. Very scared, I tell him that we were only a couple minutes from where we were going and haven't done anything wrong. A white lady cop gets out of the passenger side of the cop car and comes over to him. She grabs his arm, tries to calm him down, and drags the other officer a couple steps in her direction. While he walks to his car, she's standing by my window. All my confidence and reasoning is suddenly back because the gun is lowered. Highly upset, I yell that I want his badge number along with his name to file the biggest complaint I could. I let her know that he, he never even took the time to look at my license or run any of my information. Again, I let her know that I was very calm and that I took directions very carefully. I let her know that we were not a threat. I also said that I felt that I was discriminated against. She came very close to the car window and told me to get the F out of there. Even though she was yelling, she said it in a way that indicated she was doing me some kind of favor. We left and continued our silent drive all the way back to the party. I didn't even go inside. I went straight home pissed off. I explained to my parents what had transpired. They demanded information from me about the cop and everything that had happened so that they could follow up. But really, they were just happy I was alive.